for the first time in our nation's history. Children could have a shorter lifespan than their parents. One out of three children are at risk for diabetes. Childhood obesity is the single most important health issue facing our nation today. Greater than heart disease. Greater than cancer. Greater than AIDS. This is a problem of our culture. It's a phenomenon of the culture of abundance. The epidemic of obesity is more rightfully called a pandemic of obesity. This is not a problem that's limited to the United States. Every country that has data over time is showing an increase in the prevalence of overweight and obesity in children and in adults. If we don't stem this tide of childhood obesity, we're going to have a group of young adults who have this problem of being overweight. And being overweight then leads to the tandem problems of high blood pressure and diabetes. Those two problems in turn lead to complications like early heart disease, uh, early stroke. Our healthcare system is going to be bankrupt in the future trying to deal with these um, uh, problems occurring in younger and younger adults. This is where um, last year our teacher asked us how much we were, she was weighing us and everybody was like 60 and 70 but I was the only one who was 80 in the class, 80 pounds. Maybe really embarrassed. People make fun of my weight. I feel good about myself, but when people make fun of my weight, I ignore them still. One of the most overlooked areas of working with kids and, and weight is the fact that they get teased tremendously for being overweight. And the stigma of, of an obesity problem is huge in a child's life. Put in there what you say back to them when they call you that. I think you said you get what? Sometimes we just tell them to shut up. Those things that happened to me as a child that were very, very negative, I took them and decided I'm not going to be that. Whatever you say that's negative, I'm not going to be that. And so I kind of fought my way through life. Or the kids that um, always boss me around and call me names. Like, it's not what's in the outside, it's what's in the inside. I mean, I'm still a person, right? Right, exactly. The perfect storm brewed over the past 20 to 30 years. We actually became removed from our food sources. You weren't buying foods, fruits and vegetables, meats, the grains from local sources. You know, it became profitable for a company to do it cheaply and sell it to a whole bunch of people. But in order to do that, we processed a little bit more, which took out more vitamins and minerals, which took out more fiber. And so a lot of little changes happened, none of it malicious. It was done to, in a capitalist society to operate more efficiently, have more of a profit, but it reached a point that we start seeing weight go up, not only in adults, but then it just it spread to kids like wildfire. Typically, food in restaurants is going to be higher in calories and fat and in salt than it would be if you make the same um, dish at home. I do think that portions, when you look at plate sizes, have increased tremendously over the years. Um, just take soda for example, um, it was very common to have an 8 ounce soda and then 16 ounces and 32 and now you know, people are drinking half a gallon of soda and not thinking anything of it. The big 64 ounce big drinks contain about a cup and a half of sugar in each. That's about a thousand calories. We have so much very very cheap sugar even when consumers don't necessarily think a food product such as spaghetti sauce ketchup still has high fructose corn syrup. So we have really, really increased the amount of sugar that um, goes into our bodies over the last 30 years. Salt is why people overeat. That's why restaurant foods are so easily eaten in large amounts because of the salt that must be put in that for you to like it. So once you get used to that kind of taste, then bland foods or foods without salt don't taste very well. I guess what surprises me the most that I hear from parents is that my child will only eat chicken nuggets and french fries and I say to them, does your child drive to these places and get this food? Many parents fall into the trap of worrying that their child is going to be hungry if they don't eat what they've just been offered. And they're right. Children should be hungry. And that's just the point. If a child never learns that they're going to be hungry if they don't eat what's offered, there's no incentive for that child to eat what's offered. OK, ask yourself these questions. How much juice or soda does my child drink every day? 
The biggest problem facing pediatric medicine is childhood obesity, and some families aren't ready to hear that. It's 500 calories a day that they drink. That doesn't include what they ate, what they snuck, what you just gave to them, the school lunch that they ate. They drank it. They didn't season it. They didn't cut it. You didn't serve it on a platter. They drank it. It's difficult to explain to a family that um, the things that you think are normal or okay or acceptable are putting your child at risk for being overweight. And by being overweight, it puts that child at risk for early onset of adult diseases. To know your family history is to understand your culture and to understand where you've come from. So for my particular family history and culture, um, I have slave ancestors and in that culture, eating and maybe even the day of the week, Sundays, you got to bring your food and sit at the table and that may be the first time in the week that you all had an opportunity to sit together and fellowship and to speak freely. And so when you celebrate, when you have a reward, when you're excited about something, food is the center of that celebration. And so when you speak to a family, you have to be cognizant of their, of their culture and say, how much does food dictate how they define themselves in their culture? It's complicated. It's complicated. It's not just about genetics, and it's not just about parenting. It's also about our environment. We are very time-starved. We're very convenience-driven. We spend a great deal of time sitting, whether it's traveling in cars, airplanes, at a computer. We spend a lot of time in schools making sure that we are meeting academic standards because they're financially tied to a budget that the school district really needs to maintain. TV, video games, computer, internet, phone, none of those by itself were bad, but as they start to add up, those are powerful forces keeping you from being physically active. You as a parent are sitting there and saying, okay, now we need to make healthy choices with the fruit and the vegetables and get our you know, daily whole grains and all the things that kids need to eat. And your kids are getting all these messages about you know, sugared foods and cereals and they're constantly being bombarded at Saturday morning cartoons, commercials, and then they're seeing advertisements for food. The number of images that they are getting is really competing with the messages that you're trying to give your child. I think there are ways we can counter this abundance with a, a more sane approach to our activity, our travel, and our food consumption, but it takes time and it's not easy. We have a project here at the CDC in which we've demonstrated that prompting people to use the stairwells and having attractive and central stairwells increases stairwell use. Now I'm not saying that stairwell use prevents overweight, but it's one way of building activity into everyday life. How do we change the environment in which our population lives so that healthier choices are easier choices, that, so that physical activity is part of everyone's day? Let's go ahead and go out. Well, the best place right now, I think, is to start in schools. Start at the ground level or your elementary schools and kind of work your way up. Outside the Frisbees to start, just anywhere outside. My job is to basically incorporate fitness activities or movement activities, kinesthetic learning into the core classrooms. Jump. Pick up one, pick up one and jump. So what I did today was just a rounding activity where you had to round, you know, 150. Does it go to 200 or 100? Instead of sitting there and circling, you know, 200, you'd actually take and move it and put it there. And that way your kids who learn kinesthetically might be more apt to remember that come SOL time because they physically did it instead of just like circling numbers as they go down a, a worksheet. I think I'm in the perfect place to make a difference in our children's lives. As a PE teacher, I have the knowledge and skills on physical fitness and activity, and all I can do is just share that with the kids and get them excited about being physically active. They have so many opportunities and so many challenges after school and even in school to be in a sedentary mode, but we want to make them excited about getting up and moving those feet and getting active and working that heart muscle, just working up a sweat. All right, got to pick it up, got to go faster now. Come on, move those feet. Move those feet, come on. 
Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, move it. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Ready? Tony Chestnut knows I love you. Tony knows, Tony knows. I put a pedometer on them in, and when they come in so I can measure how much activity they've done and they can measure also how much activity. So it's holding me and them accountable. And guess what? And you say, what? It's Tony Chestnut. When I have them come in, I want them moving. I want them excited. I want them, you know, switching from one activity to another and never getting bored. And they're working up a sweat and don't even know they're getting a good workout. When we can help them with nutrition and fitness and addressing that psychosocial piece and giving them that support and showing them by examples and being the role model and engaging the parents, then they do feel more empowered and it really doesn't take much of a success for them to feel like, oh, this is possible and I can keep going. Not enough activity. Too much TV. Not enough water. Too much soda. Not enough family meals. Too much fast food. It's now time to take that next step and how do we make interventions? How do we find some interventions that will have lasting effect? Ten to four. Many programs have shown short-term benefits. We need to make an impact that's going to be lasting. The Healthy You program is really a gem in our community. It's a program designed for children and for their parents. We have a 10-week program. They come twice a week for 10 weeks. We also do a clinic where they meet one-on-one -on -one with the dietitian, the physical therapist, the licensed clinical social worker. That's so we can really personalize the program for that specific child and household. My first contact with a family is on the telephone. And the parent will say to me, well, my child is a little big, but they're not really fat. And um, they'll say they're a little big boned, or they're husky, or they're hefty. Um, but not really overweight. And so then when I actually first meet the child and see, um, in my opinion, they would be considered overweight. But I think because one in five children now is overweight and two out of three adults is overweight, we are surrounded by so many people that are struggling with their weight that it becomes easier for me then as a parent to say, well, yes, my child is a little overweight, but they're not as overweight as your child or my neighbor's child. I come from a family of people who are all in the obese category. My mother was diabetic. She had high blood pressure. If my mother had dealt with the fact that I was an overweight child, she would have had to deal with the fact that she was an obese woman. And what was she doing in the house? And, and that's a difficult thing to do. You are the biggest role model for your kids. Your kids are going to do exactly what you do. If they see you making better choices, they're going to make better choices. People are exercising a little more. They tend to want to eat better. So the two really go hand in hand. And you can make small changes in both to make a huge impact on your life. Out, cross, as a parent, take the time and make those good decisions for them to set a good example, which is why I try to come here and exercise. So they know that when they're exercising, I'm sweating too, just like they are. We work with children from ages two to five, and it involves movement, uh, which is our exercise and just creative movement, having fun with scarves and you know, being bags and just having moving in that section. Uh, we also do story time, which we help teach health and nutrition through that. And uh, we have our crafts and then our loved snacks to try and help teach them to eat healthy. He's made his sandwich. Eat, eat healthy foods to keep your body strong. Too much candy, junk, and pop does your body wrong. Eat healthy foods. They're good for you. <laughs> Four, five. Individual behavior change is important, but if you've got a system or a lack of a system in place that's contributing to a problem, you have to address it. Um, policies regarding food um, and fitness and activity can be very important, not only in our schools, but also in our after-school programs and our daycare centers and our child care providers. We do have some child care centers that choose not to celebrate birthdays the same way other places do. 
they actually have the parent bring in a, a box of cake mix and they prepare the box of cake mix together as a class project and the parent is to bring fresh fruit to slice and serve on top of the cake. Our cultures celebrate occasions with food. When you're happy you eat, let's go out for dinner and celebrate. And when you're sad, oh, come here, come on over, we'll have something to eat because you're sad. And so we started to think about rewarding with just not food at all. And so we use stickers and we use extra um, time in the art center or you could be the first one at the water table. And what we're doing at that is building intrinsically motivated children. Children that get satisfaction and gratification from themselves as the reward of doing something instead of an external always coming in that wow, I get to have some kind of a reward food-wise. Part of it is just somebody stepping up and saying, we're not going to do it this way anymore. This is not our policy anymore. We're probably going to create standards of health as well to really focus on the kind of nutrition, exercise, um, uh, instructional elements that ought to be put in schools to really get our kids started on some good early habits. We created a governor's scorecard in Virginia, which is all positive and so you can be a bronze, a silver or a gold winner as a school based on your nutritional components around snack machines, around your lunch, around the amount of activity and year over year improvement and that's been very positive. We're asking children to make choices that some adults won't even make. You know, you're asking a child what do you want, pizza or a salad? Well. A child's going to choose the pizza. Most adults are going to choose the pizza over a salad. Wouldn't it be great if you started the school day, say, with 10 or 15 minutes of yoga? In a perfect world, <laughs> every child would have breakfast, yogurt, fruit, something from at least two different food groups. A lot of us will skip breakfast. Absolutely the worst thing to do. A lunch which consists of let's say a sandwich and either a fruit or a vegetable. Pretzels or fruits, grapes, uh, carrot sticks, those are a great way to get some crunch and give you that little boost of energy we need to get home for the, the meal. So three meals, preferably not in front of a TV, um, after school snacks that exclude junk food, I would be happy. Eating at the table with the TV off is the family meal. The benefit of family meals just goes on and on. Stretching. The general cost of obesity to our society was 75 billions of dollars in 2004, and the number is still increasing. Half of its direct costs, costs for medication to treat obesity, costs for complications, hospitalization. The other half is indirect costs, where time lost from work, time lost from school. I think it is an overwhelming burden on our economy. Children under poverty line, they are at least 30% 30, 30 more likely to be overweight. I had a young lady come up to me, I believe she was in the third grade, and um, I had been talking to her class for about two weeks about eating healthier. She said she went home and she talked to her mom about getting fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and using those as snacks. And her mom said that that was a good idea. However, it was a lot cheaper for her to go and buy, you know, hot dogs, um, pre-packaged like, gummy fruits and gummy snacks and those kind of things than it is to go and get um, fruits and vegetables. Plus, the fruits and vegetables go, go bad so quickly. I remember sitting in a soccer game with uh, a number of dads and one of the dads was talking about how he felt one of the kids out there was fat. I have followed this family over a couple of years and identified a problem the first year and said, you know, not only is the weight out of proportion to the height, but quite frankly, your child is overweight. Both of her parents were overweight and had type 2 diabetes. They were in their early 20s and their parents had type 2 diabetes and it was just really sad because you know this little beautiful beautiful little girl um, you know sitting there on the bed with her IV drip one of the dads was talking about how he felt one of the kids out there was fat and chubby was ruining the chances of that team actually going to any kind of playoffs because he couldn't move because he was too overweight at first in the room there wasn't really a sense of urgency to change anything there wasn't um, any idea that any disease would afflict this child. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, what is life going to be like for her? 
She said, you know, everybody in my family looks like this. And I didn't realize that my, my son was really overweight and not able to keep up on a physical level like the other kids until I started coming to these games. And I sat there and I thought, I don't know how to get through to this family. This young lady needs to make a change. Is she going to have cardiovascular disease? Is she going to have a stroke at 30 or 40? Is she going to lose a foot? Is she going to lose a limb? Is she, she going to have kidneys that fail? Is she going to lose her eyesight from this? Three generations of diabetes, three generations of high blood pressure, at least two generations of early heart attack or early stroke. And this young lady has no control over that part of her family history. I think that's where we are right now is trying to figure out how do we stop this process that's happening in our communities every day? How do we stop the process now so that children never get to that point? So that ideally adults never get to that point? This epidemic is a major threat to the health of our country. It's costly, it's increasing, and it's going to drive our medical costs upward in a way that our country will be unable to control. It takes time to reverse these trends. Uh, we're going to have to have a whole cultural uh, change. We're going to have to uh, approach it from the family perspective, what a family eats. We're going to have to look at a perspective of what kind of physical activities the children engage in and make sure it's safe for them to do that. And, you know, they need to get out more. They're just sitting in front of the TV, watching TV all the time. They're playing video games all the time, and they don't get out. They need to get out. They need to get moving and get motivated and do stuff. In the neighborhoods that we live in, we have to be sure that our parks are accessible, that they're there for children to play with, and that children and parents feel safe about letting their children go to those parks. The world is getting a little rounder, and we want to see the kids live long and happy lives. And they are so, they feel so much better about themselves when they feel good. And they're not sluggish. And that's what, we, that's what we're trying to do, is just keep them up and moving. We need to walk to school with our children if that's possible. We need to push our education departments, our local education departments, to provide not only physical education, but physical education programs in which children are active most of the time. There's no magic piece of equipment. There's no magic exercise. It's, it's just you have to find the thing that you enjoy and that, that you will do. And if you can grab a friend and do it with someone, you're much more likely to do it on a regular basis and put a little more effort into it and, and have a, a fun time with it. More vigorous efforts have to be made to connect local markets, local farms to markets. So that, for example, um, strategies that, like school gardens, um, strategy like neighborhood gardens, strategies like farmers markets, strategies that connect the local production to consumption are a way of making fresh fruits and vegetables readily available, uh, as well as lowering the price because you don't pay the transportation costs. We forget that food is something that we should enjoy every single day. All the members of the family um, being involved in food preparation. So enjoying that whole process of cooking and going to the market and uh, maybe gardening, raising herbs, and, and just enjoying you know, the, the whole uh, sensory experience of food and slowing down. It's everything in moderation. I think if most people could get that in their heads and remember it, it'd be okay. Instead of thinking, I can't have it, I can't have it, I can't have it, and then all of a sudden diving into it and then eating an entire sundae when all you probably needed was a nice little scoop of ice cream to help curb that craving. We just can't wag our fingers and say stop eating uh, so much and exercise more. We have to provide a framework for the families to be able to understand what is healthy nutrition? Uh, what is a good balance of exercise and nutrition? How do we begin to lose weight and then keep it off? It's not just as simple as calories in versus calories out. It's all the other social aspects of that that have to be brought into play. You know, we didn't get this way overnight, and these are not easy solutions. It's going to take a concerted effort on many levels and for a long time. I learned that you're not supposed to go out and eat fast food. Well, I've learned how to eat better, how to exercise more, and how to um, contain my limits. Do exercise every other day, and then when you feel comfortable with it, try doing it every day. Play more and drink water. 
and eat together with your family. I think it's really important to sort of process with kids on the end of the day, how did it go today? And if your child is struggling with weight, you say, how was it with your friends? Were you teased? What did people say to you? And help kids understand that the things that other people say do not have to determine who they are. I think it, we need a bigger voice to childhood obesity. We need a bigger voice that will speak to the fast food restaurants, that will speak to the media, that will speak to advertising, that will speak loudly and say, be responsible, be considerate. These are kids, not adults and be mindful that they are our future and that if you don't treat them kindly or be considerate or be mindful of the choices we make, then we're making it difficult for their future. I know that I still have a lot of work to do, but I know that I've done a lot of work, you know, and so it's okay. I will get better at this too. <laughs> I believe in myself. I honor myself. I respect myself. It is okay to make a mistake. I forgive myself if I make a mistake. I learn from making my mistakes. I love myself no matter what. I ask for help when I need it. I feel my feelings. There are no right or wrong, good or bad feelings. Not enough fruits and veggies. <laughs> I said veggies. <laughs> Say the question again. Not too much. Not enough activity. Ah, oh, man. All right. Okay. Not enough fruits and vegetables. This is scary. It's complicated. It's completed. It's complicated.